All right, we're continuing our series on photo bombs, and if you're, it's your first time here, uh, if, first of all, thank you for coming. It's good to see you. Uh, what is a photo bomb? People ask you that. What is that? I had no idea what a photo bomb was until this past fall when my son Luke told me what it was. Uh, I was taking a picture with Hannah or somebody. He goes, "Photo bomb!" Thank you. And he jumps in. The next thing you know, he says, "Photo bomb." I'm like, "What? What on earth's a photo bomb?" He says, "Dad, when you have a good picture and someone screws it up." And my mind went off saying, that would be a great sermon series, especially during the holidays. And so uh, we talked last week about that. And how many folks know, especially this time of year, you have plenty of opportunities to have your festivities to be kind of torqued a little bit the wrong way by these unwarranted, <laughs> and these people in your family sometimes that, how many folks know you, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. And how many people know sometimes family will stretch you to a degree that you don't want to go? And, and so this series has been a little bit about that. And last week we spoke about it. Well, you have a picture perfect scenario in your life. Something's going well. Your marriage is going well. Your job is going well. Your health, health is going well. You think the family's doing well. You think you're doing fine. And then a bomb goes off to disrupt the picture perfect scenario you thought you were living. And I have news for you. If you've been on alive on this planet for any period of time, you're going to experience setbacks. You're going to experience difficulties. And so last week we spoke about that. We also mentioned the fact that this time during the year, it's a very difficult time of year for many, many, many people. We mentioned the fact the reason why that is is because Christmas is like one big long day. You hear Christmas Carol, you remember when you were five years old, you remember when you were 20, you remember when you are 80, whenever, however old you are, and the emotions that happen growing up. And maybe it's difficult because now the people that you loved are no longer with you this holiday season. Maybe because your mother or father passed away, or maybe you went through a horrible divorce and, and you think about all the damage and you have to take the kids here to there, and you have to go two different families, and it's not fun going through all that. It's just a reminder. It's just a yearly reminder of what's going on in your life and what went wrong at one time or another. And it can be really difficult. And, and, and various things take place. And so I know how difficult it can be. And so we were very cognitive of that. And last week we spoke about the very thing that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. And we talked last week that even though bad things happen, God can redeem them for something good. He doesn't cause the bad things to happen, but he may allow them. He doesn't cause them, but he can take even your worst nightmare and turn to something good. He can turn your bitterness and make you better as a result. We looked at the life of Joseph primarily about that. We encourage ourselves that there's always hope in Christ and there's always a better day ahead. No matter what you experience, you can rejoice always because of the fact that the best days are always ahead for those that love God. If you look at this earth from the vantage point of this earth, it's truly hopeless. But if you look at this earth from the standpoint of eternity, understanding that this life is temporary, it's only a little segment in the whole thing, this is preparation for eternity. So when you understand that, you can find joy in the middle of anything, unspeakable joy. So that's what we talked about last week. Today, we're gonna to talk about being offended. How many folks know what it means to be offended? Uh, I tell you, I, I, it's amazing that during the holidays, there's plenty of opportunity to be offended, right? You have to go to this dinner. You don't want to go to this dinner. You have to go to your spouse's Christmas party. You have no desire to go to this Christmas party. You have to go to this thing, and you don't want to go because you know that person that you are related to. You don't know how the gene pool put out such a person, but somehow, some way, you're related to them, and that just scares you. <laughs> and it's difficult. And how do you handle these situations when these situations happen? And uh, invariably, you will be offended by people. How do we deal with an offense? Well, Jesus is so good about talking about stuff like that, and he does in Luke chapter 17. If you can open your Bibles today, please, and follow along in the scriptures. Um, we'll go ahead and read about what Luke says about Jesus' statement about offense, being offended, being offended. Let's go ahead and read it. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible. Let me just stop there for one moment. It is impossible. When Jesus says 
something is impossible. Guess what? It is impossible. He says, all things are possible to whom who believes. But here he says, it is impossible. So when Jesus says that, I think we need to pay attention to that. It is impossible. Okay? Let's just set us up for this. It is impossible. What's impossible? It is impossible that no offenses should come. So if you're trying to live a life without offenses, guess what? It is impossible. impossible. Thank you, Fran. You got a special prize. Oh, by the way, by the way, I, I wanted to say that it's impossible. And we talk about photo bombs. I do want to show these couple script, uh, scriptures. I want to show these some of these pictures. We have a little contest here. Guys, can you put it up real quick? I don't want to forget these contests. We're looking for people to put up pictures of their photo bombs and how, you know, someone messes up your, your picture. And you can send them to cornerstonecheshire.com or go to a Facebook. Show the next one. There is another one. Okay, there's another one that's pretty good. The best one of them. No, that's a good one too. And there's a real good one coming up. There we go. Look at that. I try to take a picture of the ice sculpture, and there comes Esteban messing it up. So, so we're trying to do a little contest, and if you win the contest, you get an all-expenses-paid trip someplace. We're not going to tell you what it is until it gets closer. So if you have any interesting photo bombs, please put them on Facebook. I can't remember the exact um, email. I think it's photobomb at cornerstonecheshire.com. Send them in, and we're going to have a contest, and whoever wins. But what does it have to do with the Bible? Absolutely nothing, but I want to... I'm having fun with it, okay? Let me, ha let me have fun. All right, back to our previously uh, recorded uh, program. <laughs> okay, so Jesus says it's impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him from whom they do come. And he's talking about there, uh, we don't have time today to talk about extraordinary about that and how offenses do come and how some people bring offenses and these offenses block people from knowing God. And that's a bad thing to happen, by the way. And he goes into explicit detail of what happens. But I want to focus more about how do you and I deal with offenses. So let's just go ahead and read it and then we're going to get down to what we're talking about. We're going to explain what an offense is, how do we get rid of an offense, and how to live free. Those are the three things we're going to talk about. But let's go ahead and read the scriptures. It says, But woe to him through whom it did come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repeats, repents, excuse me, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and seven times in a day, he returns you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now, interesting, in Matthew 18, with this a parallel passage the apostle Peter comes to Jesus. He says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Three times? And he's like thinking, he's really, you know, he's really got the gusto here. He went three times. Because in the rabbinic understanding in the time of Christ, they came up with the tradition. And this is before baseball was ever invented. Remember? It's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Well, and they, they believed one offense, I'll forgive you once, twice, three times, and a lady. I'm sorry, that's in the song. Okay. Uh, once, twice, three times, and it's too late. That's it. I've given you three times. So if you, I forgave them once. And you, you go to the, the, uh, uh, the rabbi. I'm sorry. You get two more times. Second time it happens. No. Nope. Third time it happens. Okay, that's it. And so here is Peter thinking, how many times should I give my brother? Seven times? I and mean, he's like, wow, I've really ramped it up. I went double the amount plus one. That's pretty good. So Peter's probably thinking pretty highly of himself, realizing, hey, Jesus, I've gone to the other extreme. And then Jesus basically kicks it down and says the following. He says, he says to him in Matthew 18, uh, he says, verse 21, he says, I say up to the three seven times, verse 22, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times. And for some of you, you're taking track of those things. You have a little hash mark. We're up to 498. He's way past it now. What Jesus was basically saying was, you keep on forgiving someone no matter how many times it is because seven's the perfect number. And 70 times seven is basically to infinity. That's what he's saying. It was an extraordinary thing to say, which was at, totally foreign to the time of Jesus Christ, totally foreign to the Jewish culture because it's a three-time thing. That was the culture that the Pharisees taught. That's what the church taught. And by the way, sometimes the things that church teaches is not necessarily in the Bible. Like when I grew up, for example, if, you were, if women wore pants to church, they were like going to hell. If a pastor wore jeans, he'd be in trouble and, you know, and all this other stuff. You know, that's like tradition. 
That's tradition. And sometimes we make tradition like scripture. And this is what the uh, rabbis were doing. They never said that in the Bible three times, but they put that in there. So be careful. Uh, these things that we hold so dearly and tightly to, make sure it's really scriptural. And let's not make doctrine out of things that are just a point of view rather than being the Bible. That's just a little side note um, I wanted to mention to you about that because that's what was happening in that time. So he goes, woe to that. Verse 5 of Luke 17. And the apostle said to the Lord, and listen to this, I'll, I'll go back and take it to verse 3 of Luke 17. Take heed for yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. I like that. Rebuke him. Okay, so it's okay. We live in a culture today, it's like, hey man, don't judge anyone. Well, there comes a time you might say, hey dude, that was dumb. That was wrong. You hurt me, you hurt your mother, you hurt your father, you hurt your brother, you hurt myself. What you did was wrong. Go ahead and rebuke him. It's okay to do that. Rebuke him, the Bible says. Don't you like that? I like that part. Okay, rebuke him. Verse 5. Um, you can say, um, verse, uh, here we go. You know, I love these 46-year-old eyes. Here we go. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and you shall forgive him. He returns, you say, I repent. And then the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. You know, they, they saw a lot of great things in the time of Christ. They saw him walk on water, but they say increase our faith. Why? Because it's all so hard to forgive people, isn't it? God, increase our faith. I'm supposed to forgive someone 70 times 7. That means there's no limits on it. God, I'll rebuke him, but then I have to forgive him? Ouch, how am I supposed to do that? Lord, increase our faith. And I would say to you today, it takes a lot of faith to forgive somebody for several different reasons. Because you have to believe that God is going to take care of the situation. So, amazing thing. An amazing thing. And so, this is what happened to that. Now, it also says, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, you see, what happens is when someone does something against you, it offends you. It offends you. And the Bible talks about it right here. When you're offended, what happens next? I look at an offense. Like, suppose someone does something to me and says the wrong thing to me and says something nasty to me. I'm offended by that. If I hold on to that offense, guess what happens? That offense drops a seed in the soil of my heart. The next thing you know, I got a root of bitterness that starts to develop. And uh, a root of bitterness is like a weed. And, and I just, I, I am amazed how hard it is to grow healthy grass. I can't do it. My, my, my lawn's a disaster. But somehow, some way, this weed will find its way in my concrete driveway. If there's a little thing, it comes right through. And that's of what offense will do. If you're not careful, the root of bitterness will come. And the next thing you know, it holds hostage the fruit of your life. What you can find that begins to happen is that your health is compromised. Your relationships get compromised. It can literally change your health. And it can sabotage your life if you're not careful, and you can become a better person. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. This is what he says here. This is the, the author. Work at living in peace. Let's just stop there for a moment. It should not be so hard to have a relationship. Well, the Bible says work, work. It takes work to live at peace. It takes work for a nation to be at peace. It takes work to have peace. So, Get over it. It takes work. It takes work. Work at living in peace with everyone. And work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other. Look after each other. Each other. You want to do a great study in the scriptures? Do an each other study. Fantastic. How much God wants us to be in community. Look after each other. That, that none of you fails to receive the grace of of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Bitterness is a horrible thing. If it gets a hold of you, it will destroy you. There's no value in bitterness. Literally no value. It's a characteristic you don't want to have. And bitterness often comes through an offense. We're going to be offended. But how do you handle that offense, and what do you do with the offense before it becomes bitterness, before it poisons you, before it destroys your relationship? And by the way, if my relationship is compromised with another person, my relationship is compromised with God. It says in 1 John, if you hate your brother whom you do see, you can't love God who you do not see. How I treat another individual shows how I am with God himself. Make no mistake. 
So the Bible talks about this root of bitterness and how it will choke every area of your life. And it will attack. My friends, it will attack you. It will literally attack your health. It will attack your health. It will attack your relationships. It will attack your finances. It will attack your children's children if you're not careful, where bitterness becomes a part of life. And this is what I've learned about an, uh, an offense. If you're not careful, an offense will build a fence. An offense will build like a fence, quarantine you from other people and even God. No, God's bigger than your sin, of course, but he will allow you to walk away from it. So if, if I get like embittered by somebody, and I can't believe they said that about me. They spread this rumor about me and, just, and hurt me and hurt the church. And I get irritated about that person. The next thing you know, I start building a fence. I'll never let that happen again. I'll never open my heart again to somebody that can trample my heart. I'm done with having real friends because real friends can give you real hurt. I'm done falling in love. I'm done with that because it hurts. And what happens you build a fence. And it's almost like this over here. You see this drum cage because uh, the drummers are kind of crazy. You had to put them in a cage. But uh, it's like going in this cage, and the next thing you know, you got this barrier between you and people. You've, you surround yourself with this, and people can't get at you. They can see you. You can see them. But it's like there's like a fence. There's something separating you from another person. And this is why so many people live a life of isolation. You, you get to know them. They're all friendly and nice, but bam, you can come up against a brick wall. You can't get to know them. And maybe that's the way you are. You're real friendly, you're real cordial, you talk about the weather, you talk about uh, the current events happening in the world, you even get a little political once in a while and talk about sports and all that, but man, that's as far as you go. You go no further because they got this thing up, they got this shield up. Now, I'm offended by people, I've built a fence in my life and don't you dare cross it. And so how many people notice that in life that begins to happen? An offense. And we also do as uh, we begin to draw a line. I can tell you a quick story. Um, my mom and dad used to live here. Uh, I better be careful because the person might be watching on the internet. You never know. So I'll be careful. Let me say more generalized. There was a scenario where we had a house. My family, my, my mom and father had a house on about an acre of property. There was a person on the right, a person on the left. And we had this cantankerous neighbor, this neighbor that was just the beautiful. I mean, everyone had their lawns manicured, had flowers out, beautiful. And this guy's house was out of sorts. Uh, he broke the code of the neighborhood. He had like broken tractors in his yard. He had like an old washing machine. Uh, he had old, uh, old lawnmowers, and he would just put it right on the property line, right next to our house. So when my mother would be washing the, or when my dad was washing the dishes, and my mom was uh, reading the newspaper, uh, they would see. <laughs> Mom and Dad, if you're watching, I love you. I'm, I'm lying for you, okay? Anyhow, so as she was doing that, they would see this horrible neighbor with this, all this junk. And then he built a pool on top of it, which is fine. Nothing wrong with the pool. And he has this fence. But behind, you have this uh, chlorination. You have the filter system was right there and the propane tank, which was rusty. He got, must have got it on Craigslist before Craigslist was invented. So he's sitting there with this rusty propane tank and all this paraphernalia, and it's right in our field of view. So my parents are like, they, you know, what do you do with this guy? And then the guy would walk down the property line every day. It was really strange with his dog. He'd walk up and down the property line, look at it. It was really bizarre. And, and we, tried, we tried the best we could to, to make peace with this guy. And then he wouldn't paint his house. I mean, it was just it was a disaster. It was a disaster. So my, my parents were like, you know what? We had enough. We're going to buy a fence. So they went to town hall, and they got the highest fence they possibly could that was legal. So they put the fence up. Well, guess what the guy did? He piled everything against the fence. And then what happened is, here's our house. Imagine this is our house, and we have like a little bit of area, and then the fence starts. He put everything in our field of view right there. So my parents said, we had to put a fence around the whole property line? And, and, and this guy was getting irritated. He would kind of smirk at us. We went in the driveway. We tried to show him the love of Christ, and we asked God to take him out several times. And uh, Anyhow, and... Um, and then eventually what happened was uh, even a tree was growing, and my dad said, it's right in our, it's, it's leaning against the fence. My dad took a pair of shears and cut the thing off. The guy threatened to take us to court. So it was insane. And this guy built a fence, and it got to such a point that he'd be really offended if you cross it. How many people know people like that, where it's like, you got a scenario like this. I'm going to do it over here this time. 
uh, a scenario like this where you don't want to cross this line. You don't want to go in this area of their life. If, if you talk about their weight, oh boy. Honey, how does this look on me? You don't answer the question, man. You just say, it looks, it looks great. What do you mean by that? Oh boy. So you have this caution area. And you, uh, I don't want to talk about um, Mrs. Smith or, or John's situation. You know how he just sometimes, he, uh, he, he lives very extravagantly or he drinks way too much and he drives the car. We don't want to talk about that with him. And so, you know, this is an area. And you try to tell someone, that maybe they got a problem with drugs. Maybe they have a problem with their language. Maybe they have a problem with some kind of sin. And if you go there, you're just looking for trouble. And the person explodes and at you. And you, you basically, you make a caution tape. You say, I am not crossing that line. Because if I cross that line, I know there's going to be heaven to pay antimon. All right? There's going to be a problem if I cross this line. And so you quarantine the person out. And you don't want to go there. You're afraid to go there. Because if you go there, there's going to be a lot of problems. Get this off the air. A lot of problems. And so you want to get rid of it. Hope you don't mind us, Devin. I'm cluttering your worship space. All right. Don't be offended, okay? Don't be offended now, okay? You, I crossed the line. All right, I'm sorry about that. And so there's an area that they just don't want to cross because if you cross this area, they're offended and you're afraid to go there. You're afraid to go there. And so as a result, what happens is either they're extroverted and they kind of get upset or they just kind of, what's the matter? Nothing. You know, they get this cold of ice type of thing happening that, that the great philosopher Farn, Farner sang about. You're as cold as ice. Okay, that's beside the point. So they act real cold. And, and what happens is you're afraid. So I'm like, I'm not going there anymore. I'm not talking about how they spend their money. I'm not talking about how they're raising their kids. And, and listen to this. And for those of you that are in-laws and you have, uh, you have sons and daughters-in-laws and you don't like the way they're raising their kids and you try to offer just a little advice to help them. Oh, boy, don't go there, right? And so they you know, say, okay, I'm not talking about them anymore, even though the kid's like slashing tires in the neighborhood. I'm going to go, oh, your kids are wonderful. We're not going to cross that line because we know if we cross that line, our head's going to be bit off or you're going to take us off the Christmas list. We're not, you'll unfriend us on Facebook. <sighs> How many of you have been unfriended on Facebook? That really hurts me deeply. <laughs> I'm really offended by that. So we get offended. And the, the, the funny thing is it, it becomes a protected territory. Don't touch it. Don't go, don't touch it. Don't go there. And this is what we find. And the question is, let me ask you a question this morning. When's the last time someone came to you and challenged you in something in your life? Maybe challenge the way you're, if you're married, how you treat your spouse, if you're going to school, how you handle your homework or how you're studying or maybe uh, they challenged you how maybe what you were eating or how you were living your life. When's the last time someone challenged you about your spiritual walk with Christ? When's the last time someone challenged you in anything? If you can't think of a time, could it be you're that person? Could it be you're the person that has all these, have built a fence, you have all these lines, people are afraid. They want to have a relationship with you and they realize, I just can't go there with that person. I know a lot of people that way and so do you. But could it be that you and I are that person? If people are not challenging on an ongoing basis, that's unhealthy. Let me say that again. If no one in your life is challenging you in a good way. I'm not talking about people that are out to get you. I'm talking about friends that care about you. If you're not being challenged in your life to grow, there's a problem. Because guess what? None of us are perfect. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 that we should grow up in every and the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ himself until we meet him one day. And no one is perfect in this room. I hate to tell you that today. No one's perfect. And by the way, I, I, I'm going to ask you a favor. I pro, I'm going to make you a promise. I, I promise you that I will offend you eventually. If I haven't offended you yet, please forgive me. I promise you I will. Why? Because I'm a human being. I'm going to say something that's going to offend you. I'm going to do something that offends you. It's just the way life is. We're going to talk about that in a few moments and what happens from that. But if no one's challenging, that's not a good thing. Because we're called to be a body of Christ. In 301 today, we're going to talk about how the church works a little bit together by having our gifts. And if you have no one helping you out, how are you supposed to live the Christian life? How are you supposed to become better? And so it's so important. And, and let me ask you a couple of questions. They ask this. Do you explode over little things? 
It's like someone comes home and they leave the toothpaste cap off the toothpaste and you think that someone killed somebody. Or how about this? You leave the dishes in the dishwasher without putting them away and you go crazy. Someone cuts you off in traffic and you have a nervous breakdown. You turn into Jack the Ripper. Okay, there could be a problem with you. If you're exploding over little things, chances are you've got a lot of bitterness or anger in your life. Do you tend to make mountains out of molehills? Do you, uh, do you frequently take things the wrong way? Someone says hello to you, how you doing? What do you mean by that? <laughs> I just said hi. I, that's all I did, I said hello. You said hell, oh I'm gosh, I just said hello. You know, they hear everything. Do other people consider you high maintenance? You know, as my mom used to say, save your drama for your mama. You know, people that are just full of drama. Full of drama. And if no one has done that, if no one's challenged you, if, if someone can't come to me, I love when guest speakers come because um, it gives me an opportunity to, to find out more about our church. I usually take them out to lunch afterwards. I say, hey, David or whoever, uh, David Wagner, whoever I bring here, Jan, I'll say, hey, guys, uh, tell me, how do you think church went today, and what are some good things you saw, and what are some things we can improve on? They say, oh, everything was great. The Holy Spirit was there. No, no, no. Come on, no. Come on. Be frank with me. All right. You really want to know? Yes. Okay. Bum, 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 bum. Oh. <laughs> and don't tell me stuff. And, and it kind of hurts a little bit. Wait a minute. But I know the Bible says in Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are profuse. Iron sharpens iron, and when you sharpen iron, there's a friction, there's shards of metal that come off. If you have no one in your life that's going to challenge you, there's a problem. We're supposed to help each other become more like Christ. And if you live an isolated life and have these shields of protection and have these lines, it's not a good thing. And so I thank God. There was a situation a number of years ago that happened to me. I've shared it with you before, but it, it's one of, the, one of the major areas of my life that was transformed. There was a situation where I was working someplace, and I knew this person fairly well. There were Christians and all that, and, and to make a long story longer, as Tim walks out, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I hope I didn't offend you. Get over it. Build a bridge. Uh, and so uh, this person told me, I, I was laughing at something, I made a comment, and she said, you know, you got a problem with this, and you don't even realize it. And I'm like, I, said, I told her right, I said, lady, lighten up a little bit. You know, I was watching something on, on uh, watching someone on television, I made some kind of a little racial remark, something sly about an African-American person that was on, just a little thing. I said, you know, well, you need to relax a little bit, because, you know, I joke all the time about being Italian and German, da, 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 da. how many folks know there's a big racial wound in our culture today? Doesn't take a genius to turn on the television to see what's going on. There's a, there's a great divide, there's a lot of offenses, and we should be people that are mending and helping people have, have healing. So I, I said a little comment, and I went home, and I was agitated. I was, oh man, what, these, these African Americans need to relax, and I, I, tell, I tell German jokes and Italian jokes, and man, what's people, man, I'm so sick of walking on eggshells with everybody, I'd be PC for everything, I was getting agitated with myself. And, I, and then I, all of a sudden, I remember the scripture I used to heard from uh, 2 Bucci 3.17 says, <laughs> you shall know the truth, and it might make you angry first. And I have learned that if I explode or something agitates me, I, uh-oh, something's going on. I do in self-diagnostic mode. I start defragging my spirit. Okay, God, why did what she say get me so upset? And God, the guys, let me, let me tell you something. If someone says something to you and you get all upset, why don't you stop letting your emotion control you? Well, I'm upset. Well, be, a, be an adult. Be a human. Be a Christian. Don't act like a fool. Go back by yourself and say, why am I so irritated? Ask yourself, why am I so irritated? Is it because my pride is being injured? Is it because I'm something? Ask yourself. And then when I ask myself, why am I so upset? Well, I'm upset because she thinks I'm a racist. Well, so what? Who cares if that? And I said, now the Holy Spirit said to me, like, you know what? You got a problem. You think you're better. You're not a racist. You're an elitist. So what's that? It means you think you're a higher class of person with those people over there. And, and I heard that. The Holy Spirit brought it to my attention, and I began to cry. I, I mean, I normally don't cry unless I see a Hallmark commercial. So I, I, you know, I, began to, I began to cry, and I realized that I made a mistake, and that I realized I thought I was better than other people. I was an elitist, and I realized it was something generational. Mom and dad are fine, okay? 
but that are watching. But, you know, it kind of ran in our culture. And as a result of that, I began to cry out, and I said, God, please forgive me. So, the, you know, I got offended. And then I, that offense was an opportunity for me to learn to grow. You know, your offense is going to be a lot better. Guess what happened the following day? The following day, I went back to the campus. I was in graduate school, and it was like I put glasses on for the very first time. If you've ever had your glasses on, oh, those are, those are what leaves are. Uh, well, I began to see African Americans, Hispanics, all kinds of people in a different light. Now, don't take this the wrong way, please. I'm going to say something that's going to maybe get you a little irritated and might offend you. I saw an African-American woman, and I was attracted to her and wanted to ask her out. Now, that is huge in my culture. That would have never happened unless God did a work in me, but it had happened through an offense. And the reason I'm married to a Hispanic woman from Colombia, And I have opened myself up to the delicacies of the Latin culture. <laughs> There's something to be said about a Latin, oh, never, never mind. Anyhow, but uh, yeah, let, let me just say this. <laughs> let me just say this. That offense was a bridge for me to grow in Christ. That was an obstacle that was stopping me from being the man of God that I'm called to become. And an offense brought it out. So not all offenses are bad. When an offense comes, don't build a fence. Ask yourself a question, why am I, look, guys, can we grow up here? I'm serious, I'm not trying to, no one, let's just be honest here. Can we be adults here? Can, can we just stop letting our emotions control us? Can we stop letting offenses control us and let our emotions go wild? If you're upset, ask yourself the reason why. And, and, and oh, just stop it and say, God, why am I upset? Because they don't respect me. Well, what, I mean, we, how do you know they don't respect you? And this is another thing. Have you ever noticed that everyone thinks they're a good driver? Have you noticed that? I have news for you. Not all of you are good drivers. All right? And I know some people that think, well, I'm a good judge of character. Well, almost everyone I meet tells me that. Well, I know they meant that because I'm a good judge of character. I have, I have a, and if you're charismatic or pretty call, I have a discerning spirit. I, that's one of my spiritual gifts. Oh, really? So, in other words, you can look into a human heart and know exactly what they're thinking. Is that what you're trying to tell me? So... <laughs> This is an ornery bunch. <laughs> so, so many times we think we know what our other person's thinking. That's just silly. You don't know. You may have an idea, but we assume things. And when you assume things, you know what happens. You make, you know, okay, I'm not going to get there today because this is what begins to happen. And you think you understand what a person is going through. You think you understand uh, if what's happening. Why not think the best of someone instead of the worst? I heard Bill Johnson, one of the pastors I like to listen to, he's good. He said the following, he said, I made a decision that if you offend me, you need to tell me because I'm not going to take it that way. I said, man, that is smart. Think about it. Why be offended? What, what good does it do to get offended? Just let it go. Eh, so what? You know, there's a, there's a great song called Let It Go. Have you ever heard it? Okay. So let it go. Don't you dare sing it. Let it go. <laughs> so let it go. Why bother you? And so why not think the best of each other instead of the worst? Ask yourself, why am I offended? Ask yourself that question. And assume a benevolent motive. Assume I must have misunderstood what they said. Generally speaking, most of our conflicts are over misunderstandings. Really. A lot of wars have been under misunderstandings. People assume things and label people and put them in quarantine them. You know, learn humility. You don't know everything. You're not God. You can't look into my heart, and I can't look into yours. I can see your behavior, and I can make an assessment upon that, but it's not, not 100%. Only God knows a person's heart. You do not know a person's heart. You see their fruit. You can judge their fruit, but ultimately God has the final say, not you. And accept imperfection. Guess, guess what? You're imperfect too. You're going to make a mistake. If you don't give grace, you're not going to receive grace. So understand that as well. Jesus says the following. I love it. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there, there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. Obviously, Jesus was a pastor. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I know people that come to church, not in this church, other churches across the town, 
but they're, every time the door's open, they're in church, but they're offended with their spouse, and they don't go home and spend time with their spouse, and they'll sit here in church, and they'll sing, and all. Guess what? The best thing for you to do is leave church, go home, get right with your spouse, get right with your kids, get right with whoever you need to get right with, and make it right. Because you know what? That's the meat and potatoes of Christianity. It's all about people, not systems, not forms, not church services, not worship choruses. It's not about that. It's about people. It's about God, and it's about people. That's, and you boil it all down, loving God and loving people. If you're not loving people well, there's a problem with you and God too, because God loves people. So go make it right. Go make it right, Jesus says. First, be reconciled. And Jesus uh, is amazing Esteban, you make your way up. Jesus, it's, it's absolutely amazing how he deals with this scenario because he talks about forgiveness and is teaching us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. And he basically says, if you're, uh, Father, forgive me like I forgive other people. I'm sure you've heard that before. And then he goes on to say, what, uh, put the scripture up, please, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And don't let us yield to temptation but rescue us from the evil one. Oh, by the way, there's scripture before that, verse 12, says, Father, forgive me, forgive others like you've been forgiven. And then it says, it says, Father, forgive me like I forgive others. And then it says, the next verse, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. L let, me, let me help you understand what that really means. Basically, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. Let's continue to read here. Verse 14, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you of your sins. What is, what is the ramifications of that verse? Well, put away your theological hats. Whatever it is, I don't want it, do you? If God doesn't forgive me, the ramifications of that is something I don't want to explore. And so if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. That's significant, don't you think? In fact, it says in the Lord's Prayer here, and lead us not into temptation, the verse before says, forgive me like I forgive others. Then it says in verse 13, and don't let, don't let us yield to temptation, but the rescue us from the evil one. Maybe some of you have addictions you can't break because you have unforgiveness in your life. God will say, okay, I love you, but you're not allowing me to work in your life because you won't forgive somebody. I forgave you. You're not forgiving somebody else. It's just deliver me from evil. Do you realize one of the ways we're delivered from evil is by forgiving people? The enemy is a, uh, is a prosecuting eternity. He tries to find loopholes to, to go after us. Jesus' blood's enough for it all. But his blood is forgiveness. And so it's a significant thing. And, and he even talks about a parable. He talks about a parable in the scriptures. And I'm going to just summarize in Luke 17, it talks about a parable of a man who doesn't forgive someone of a great debt. Owes him millions of dollars in today's money. He lets the guy go. And the guy says, I pay you back. Yeah, you can't pay me back. You work at, you work at a menial job, making minimum wage. You can't pay me back that. But you know what? I'm going to let you go because I think I want to give you a chance. And then this guy finds someone else that owes him a week's wage, chokes him and says, pay back. The judge hears about it and says, hand him over to the torturers until he, hands, until he pays every last cent. This is what we're talking about offenses. And really the only way we can truly be free is to learn a lifestyle of forgiveness. Learn a lifestyle of forgiveness. Can we do that today? Can we understand that today? It's important that we understand that today. Let's take down this caution tape that we have all over our lives. Listen, I'm not saying you be irresponsible. I had a, someone recently um, that I shared some, some pretty personal information with, and they violated my trust. So I basically told the person, you know what? I shared this information with you. I took a chance in our relationship, and uh, you violated my trust. I'm sorry, but I, I, until you change, I, I, can, I can no longer go any further than this. I told them. So it's okay to do that. But don't let it stick to you. Don't let it get you bitter. Okay? And understand that offenses will come. But don't build a fence. And don't have a root of bitterness take you over. Because Jesus died for you. And because he died for you, you have a chance. You're not perfect. You can't see a person's heart. Only God can. You're going to blow it. 
many times, and you're going to need grace. Give grace if you want to receive grace. Give forgiveness if you want to receive forgiveness. And why don't we make a choice here at this church that, you know what, I don't want to be offended. And why not have relationships where people can speak into your life? Why not ask someone to ask you the hard questions? I challenge you today. I challenge you today to find somebody. Test them out a little bit first. You don't tell everyone, but find some people that can ask you the hard questions. Number one, how's your relationship with God doing? If you're married, how's your marriage going? How's your purity? People should be able to ask you that, some people, and to make sure that you're covered. I'm going to ask the ushers to make their way up as we prepare ourselves for communion. There should be people in your life that can ask you the hard questions. Because you know what? We should be competing to complete each other. I want to see you become better, and you should want to see me become better. And together, if we will develop a church, what would happen if our church becomes more of a place where we build each other up for each other's good and, and try to help each other and look out for each other that we become better? Go ahead and pass out the elements, please. That's what we need to do. Can I have one too, please? Thank you. Jesus basically said, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Jesus paid the price for you and I. I don't know where you are today. I don't know how you are with God. Some of you believe in God. You believe in Jesus. You believe he rose again from the dead. And you even come to church and you know scripture. But you've never told, you never surrendered your life to Christ. You never said, Jesus, I give my life to you. If you've never given Christ control of your life, then you're not really a believer. You're just a fan of Christ. You're just a fan of Christian. A fan. You're dating Christ, but you haven't married him yet. When you marry Christ is the day you say, I'm giving my life to you. I'm handing over my rights. I'm handing over my, I'm, I'm saying basically, you're the, you're the boss of my life. No longer am I the boss of your life. When that happens, you truly are a Christian. Otherwise, you're just a fan. You're just an admirer of Christ. And some of you today, you've been coming to church all your life. But you said, I can never do that. And so you block Christ out, and Christ says, unless I have everything, I have nothing. Can't save yourself, but what you can do is open the door, let them in. And the Lord's been telling you for a long time, you say, I can't let that go. I want to just, I want to pray for you today. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray right now and ask God to come in our lives. Because you know what? He can. No matter what you've been through, He can do that for you. Pray this prayer with the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross. I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today, I declare that you are now the boss of my life. I want you to be the center of my life and the boss of my life. I choose to believe you, God. You're the captain of my, of my life. I give my life to you today. Now fill me with your grace and your spirit that I could walk the path you have before me. I want to continue to pray for some of us today that maybe have bitterness in our hearts and offenses that are just quarantining you from your spouse. Ever since that event took place 10, 5 years ago, whatever it was, you've never been so close, never been as close to your spouse as, as then. Maybe your child did something that really hurt you and you just are not as close as you used to be, or a situation happened in the church where you, you just refuse to get involved with the church. You just come, and as soon as they're over, you go out the back door. You don't want to be involved anymore. You're afraid because you got hurt in the past. Well, guess what? I've been hurt, too, by the church. But I don't serve the church. I serve Christ. And I serve his body, which is the church. When you make the body the head, there's a problem. When you make the body the head, there's a problem. Christ is the head of the church. And when he's the head, you can love the body. But when you make the body the main thing, it's a problem. So let's go ahead and pray right now. Lord Jesus, I, I recognize that I have some bitterness in my life. I realize that I am offended by many people. And right now, I confess that it's sin to be offended and to have bitterness. I release it to you. Lord, I ask you to forgive these people of what they've done. And I just remove, I choose to forgive them. Not because of how I feel because of what your word says. I choose to forgive this person in faith. Even though my emotions don't feel it, God, I'm going to say it anyhow. I pray for the grace to continue to walk in that, un that forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me, God. Set me free 
of the collateral damage of this sin of unforgiveness and bitterness. And I choose to walk in forgiveness this day by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you do something spiritual today? Why don't you contact that person that has offended you? But before you do that, make sure you get it right and say, you know, I just want to let you know you really offended me. I'm going to forgive you. No, don't do that. That's not, that's not helpful. <laughs> what about someone died and they offended you? How about this? How about write a letter to that person about the hurt that they did and say, God, this is the hurt I have. How about setting it on fire? Say, God, I gave it to you. I release the unforgiveness and I command all demonic activity that's attacking my life to be gone because I'm choosing to live unforgiveness. What would happen if we do that? Let's live a life where we choose not to be offended. Let's think the best of people and let's help each other become the people that God has called us to become. Jesus said, this is my body which has been broken for you. Take, eat. After they supped, Jesus took the wine and said, this is the cup, a new covenant. Nothing can wash away my sins but the blood of Jesus Christ. Guys, this is, the, this is the good part. You don't have to have it all together. He has it all together. You don't have to work for salvation. You get to receive salvation. You might think I'm not good enough. Welcome to the club. This makes us good enough. Let's all take and drink. Amen. I'm going to ask you could all stand and be so kind, please. I'm going to ask Esteban to lead us in a closing, closing song. As he does, I'm going to ask the, the prayer team to make their way up. If you, if you prayed a prayer today about giving your life to Christ, it's a connection card. You can sign it up. There's boxes at each door. You can put the connection card there or a note or something. If you need prayer for a situation at work or your kids or whatever it is, listen, we want to just pray with you and just say, let's go to God together. It's so nice to have someone you can pray with. And these folks that are coming, these men and women that are coming forward are people that love God and they love, they love to see God's people. And so, you know, we're just, we're just joined together. We're, we're all on this path together. Let's become the people God's beca- called us to become. Amen? Go ahead, Esteban. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I'll sing out and remind my soul that I am yours, I am forever yours, I am yours, I am yours for all my days, Jesus I Lord bless you today. May you be filled with his peace and his grace. Let's walk in the life of grace and love in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and do that. God bless you guys. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, stay forward.